What was the world like at the time of the birth of Jesus Christ? Simply stated, the world was Rome. The Roman Empire was enjoying a period of relative peace and minimal military expansion known as the Pax Romana, Latin for Roman peace. This season in Roman history occupied the years from 27 BC to 180 AD when Emperor Marcus Aurelius died. Caesar Augustus led Rome into this period of moderation and his successors generally imitated his policy. But prior to the reign of Augustus, the Roman Empire of the first century BC was ripped apart by three slave civil wars, by civil war between Julius Caesar and Pompey, and three civil wars between Octavian and Agrippa and Mark Anthony. The final war of the Roman Republic ended around 30 BC with the deaths of Mark Anthony and the Egyptian queen Cleopatra. In January of 27 BC, the Roman Senate gave Octavian the new title of Augustus and near dictatorial powers. The name of Augustus was a religious title that symbolized a stamp of authority over humanity. This action initiated a season of imperial peace that allowed the Roman Empire to heal from its century of bloody civil war. For nearly 300 years prior to the birth of Jesus Christ, the region of Judea, later known as Palestine, had not known national peace. This small geographical area was the bloody political pawn between competing empires of the Babylonians, Assyrians, Persians, and Greece in the Seleucid and the Ptolemy conquests. In the second century BC alone, Judea endured six Syrian wars. Rome annexed Judea in 63 BC, ending the Hasmonean Kingdom. The installation of King Herod the Great in 37 BC under Mark Anthony and Octavian ushered in the Herodian dynasty. Into this world of political intrigue and blood, Jesus Christ was born. This thought brings up a question. When was Jesus Christ born? In order to date an event in history, we must establish the terminus a quo, the earliest limiting point, and the terminus ad quem, the latest limiting point. The Gospel of Luke provides these points. Luke chapter 2, verse 1 and 2. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quinarius was governor of Syria. Indirectly, this reference identifies three political personalities that will closely date the birth of Jesus Christ. These events are the reign of Caesar Augustus, the reign of King Herod the Great, and the census and governorship of Quinarius in Syria. The death of King Herod the Great in March of 4 BC establishes the terminus ad quem, the latest limiting point, since Jesus could not be born after this date. But still, this is too vague of a time frame. The reign of Caesar Augustus could establish our earliest limiting point but his reign was from 44 BC to August 19th of 14 AD. This is too large of a time frame to accurately pinpoint a date for the birth of Jesus. The Syrian governorship of Quinarius brings clarity to the birth of Christ. According to ancient historical documents and archeological evidence, Quinarius, governor of Syria, officiated over two censuses. The first census was conducted between 5 BC and 1 BC. This census was conducted according to Jewish custom under the auspices of King Herod that required the Jewish population to return to their ancestral homes for taxation. This census was a population tax. The second census officiated by Quinarius was around 7 AD, noted in Acts chapter 5 verse 37 and Josephus that resulted in the Sephorius Revolt. 
and it was conducted according to Roman custom and was a taxation of property. From these events and the internal evidence of Scripture, Jesus was born between the fall of 5 B.C. and April of 4 B.C. The confusion between the historical date and the traditional date of Christ's birth was indirectly caused by Pope John I in 525 A.D. when he asked Dionysius, a Scythian monk, to prepare a standard calendar of the Western world based upon the Alexandrian system of dating. Simply stated, Dionysius made a four-year mistake and historical evaluation of the ancient records and archaeological evidence not available to Dionysius corrected the mistake. According to early church tradition, the day of Christ's birth was December 25th. Could this date be plausible? The one objection to a winter date is the flocks being outside during the winter months. There is no concrete evidence to support this concept. But according to Jewish custom, during the summer months, the flocks were taken to the higher elevations for shade and water. But during the winter months, the flocks returned from the wilderness and situated around the cities. Luke's narrative states that the flocks were stationed around the town of Bethlehem in support of this custom. The shepherds being with their flocks would not be unusual because the lambing season in Israel can be as early as October and as late as February. The selection of December 25th by the Roman Catholic Church was a slow 200 year process. The first references to December 25th as the birth date of Jesus Christ was made by a second century theologian named Hippolytus and a third century Alexandrian theologian named Origen who attempted to blend Greek philosophy with Christian thought. The first celebration of December 25th in the Western Roman Empire as the birth date of Christ occurred in 336 AD under the authority of Emperor Constantine the Great. Chrysostom, in 386 AD, supported the December 25th date as the correct date. Therefore, the date was incorporated into the official church calendar. Was Jesus Christ born on December 25th of 5 BC? Probably not. But a fall and early winter date is plausible. Because the Gospels are concerned with a person, it's of the utmost importance that we know who this person is and where he came from. Often Christians, in reading the Gospels, skip the genealogy of Jesus in Matthew chapter 1, verse 1 through 17, and Luke chapter 3, verse 23 through 38. The genealogies may seem boring, but they provide important insight into the plan and purpose of God. Out of these recorded genealogies, one verse stands out, and that verse is found in the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's important we consider the introduction to the Gospel of Matthew because of the emphasis placed on the relationship between David and Abraham and Jesus Christ. Why do we see this emphasis? The answer is simple. David and Abraham were the only ancestors of Jesus Christ who received an unconditional eternal covenant from God that determined the course of history and found their fulfillment in the person of Jesus. Let's explore the covenant of Abraham recorded in Genesis chapter 22, 16 through 18. And he said, by myself I have sworn, saith the Lord, for because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee, and in multiplying I will multiply thy seed as the stars of the heaven, and as the sand upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. 
in these verses, God promised Abraham that his physical descendants would inherit Israel and his seed would be blessed. God also promised Abraham, after the sacrifice of Isaac, that his seed would be the blessing of the nations of the earth. According to Galatians chapter 3, verse 6 through 18, the seed of Abraham who inherited the promise was Jesus Christ. Paul emphasized that God's promise to bless the nations of the world through the seed of Abraham was not made to all of his descendants, but was a direct reference to the birth and mission of Jesus. Jesus Christ became the blessing of the entire world through his blood sacrifice on Calvary to pay for the sin of the world. John the Baptist also realized that the mission of Jesus Christ was to fulfill the covenant of Abraham by presenting Jesus as the Lamb of God, which take away the sin of the world. Jesus Christ's coming as the Lamb of God caused him to become our eternal high priest. The first advent of Jesus Christ revealed to the world his eternal high priest ministry. Now let's explore the covenant of David recorded in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 12 through 16. And when thy days be fulfilled, and thou shalt sleep with thy fathers, I will set up thy seed after thee, which shall proceed out of thy bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my mercy shall not depart away from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before thee. And thine house and thy kingdom shall be established forever before thee. Thy throne shall be established forever. God also made a covenant with David that his house, kingdom, and throne would be established forever. The Apostle John understood that Jesus Christ was the fulfillment of the covenant of David, and he was the promised seed who would inherit David's throne. The second advent of Jesus Christ will reveal to the earth the eternal kingship of Jesus Christ. Zechariah chapter 6, 12 and 13. And he spake unto him, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold the man whose name is the branch, and he shall grow up out of his place, and he shall build the temple of the Lord, even he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory, and he shall sit and rule upon his throne, and he shall be a priest upon his throne, and the council of peace shall be between them both. Zechariah the prophet envisioned a coming day when the Messiah would build the temple of the Lord, the body of Christ, and rule upon his throne. Zechariah also understood that the final mission of the Messiah would be to merge his high priesthood ministry with his kingship. The day the world experiences the eternal king priest is the day the world will know the true counsel of God's eternal peace, and that day is yet to come. Now it should be obvious why God rejected King Saul as the king of Israel when he presented himself to the nation as a priest who could offer sacrifice. Saul was never to be the eternal king priest nor was his reign to symbolize the king-priest prophecy. There is currently three major views concerning the genealogies of Christ recorded in the Gospels of Matthew and Luke. The first view being that both genealogies give the descent of Joseph. Matthew presents the real genealogy while Luke identifies the legal descent. The second view considered is that Matthew presents Joseph's legal descent as successor to the throne of David, while Luke identifies Jesus' real parentage. The third view debated that Matthew presents the real descent of Joseph, while Luke identifies the real descent of Mary. 
the most widely accepted view is that Matthew's Gospel gives the real descent of Joseph, while Luke provides the real descent of Mary, and Joseph's name was substituted according to Jewish custom. Even though Joseph's name was substituted for Mary's name, Jesus' legal right to the throne of David was clearly transmitted through the genealogies of both Joseph and Mary. The fact that Jesus could trace his lineage to the throne of David through both paternal lines makes his claim to the throne very strong. The Jewish nation was meticulous in their maintenance of genealogical records, and these records were preserved in the temple until its destruction in 70 AD by the Romans. The Gospel writers had access to these records and accurately traced the genealogy of Jesus. There can be no doubt that Jesus offered himself to Israel as their Messiah, and his claim to Davidic descent was never challenged. The Sanhedrin would have consulted these records to verify Jesus' ancestry. Had the Sanhedrin found any flaw in Jesus' descent, they would have quickly accused him of being an imposter. The silence of Scripture on this topic is proof that Jesus has a legal inheritance to the throne of David due to his bloodline. The genealogies of Jesus Christ may be boring to read, but they provide clear evidence to the prophetic fingerprint of God. In the Old Testament, there are over 15 prophecies recorded concerning the birth of Jesus Christ that can be directly or indirectly validated by the genealogical lists provided by Matthew and Luke. These boring lists speak the loudest in their silence. As I previously stated, the Sanhedrin had access to the same lists, and they also understood the prophecies associated with the birth of the Messiah. We see this viciously demonstrated in the actions of Herod who called the chief priests and teachers of the law to determine where the Christ child was to be born. Bethlehem was the answer given by these learned men, and the blood of innocent children flowed. It's important to note that the chief priests and teachers of the law did not accuse Jesus of being an imposter based on his genealogical bloodline. Here, silence speaks volumes. Jesus came in fulfillment of ancient prophecy spoken by the prophets and recorded by the hand of chroniclers. God took meticulous care to ensure that his only begotten son would come in fulfillment to the prophecy and vision seen from a distance far away from a time long since dead. These prophets understood that Jesus would come from the seed of a woman, would be a descendant of Abraham Isaac and Jacob, that the Messiah would come from the tribe of Judah and inherit the throne of David. Micah understood that the Messiah would be born in Bethlehem, while Daniel predicted the time of Christ's birth. Isaiah understood that the Messiah would be born of a virgin, while Jeremiah wept with the slaughter of the innocents. And Hosea witnessed the Christ child fleeing to Egypt. How important are these boring genealogies of Jesus Christ? They are everything to the plan of God. We also must stand in silence at the bloodline of Jesus Christ, like the chief priests and teachers of the law did nearly 2,000 years ago. The genealogies clearly prove that Jesus is the long-awaited Messiah, the Christ, the Son of the living God.